Lord, we ask that all that we think and say and do at this session would be honoring to you and that we would learn your word more deeply and that we would learn how to glorify you more increasingly. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, this breakout session is sponsored by Reformed Theological Seminary. Uh, we're grateful for the generous support to help make this session possible. You can learn more about RTS by visiting their booth in the exhibit hall or online at the rts.edu. I'm uh, Greg Beal. I'm a professor at Westminster Theological Seminary until June 1, and uh, then I'll join Reformed Theological Seminary at their branch in Dallas. Our topic for today is biblical theology and eschatology. And biblical theology, rightly defined, according to Gerhardus Voss, is nothing else than the exhibition of the organic progress of supernatural revelation and its historic continuity and multiformity. That's sort of a, a, a full definition but exhibition of the organic progress. What that means is that as revelation progresses and as different biblical books record that revelation, they are not recording something that is contradicting to the earlier revelation. It's organic, it's like an apple tree. Uh, it comes from an apple seed. And so biblical revelation is like that growing seed. And however different that tree may look to the seed, and it does look different, doesn't it? Uh, it's still organic. And so when we get to the New Testament, uh, some would say, oh, look, these fulfillments look much different than what the Old Testament must have foreseen. But once you look more deeply, you can begin to see how they are organic outgrowths on into the New Testament. So it's the organic progress of supernatural revelation, and it's in history, and it's historic continuity and multiformity. That means that uh, you can see how things are continuously developing, and yet there's some things that look different. Nevertheless, they're still part of that organic revelation. Now, biblical eschatology is crucial to understanding biblical theology. And by the way, according to this definition of biblical theology, if you're going to interpret a particular text in Scripture in a biblical theological manner, well, what you want to do is first give the interpretation in light of the literary context uh, and then of the redemptive historical context. And then you want to look and see how does it relate to the epics preceding and to the epics following. So biblical eschatology, which is the second part of our title today, is crucial to understand biblical theology. Why? Because it's, if not the main way, it's one of the main ways that uh, the Old Testament is related to the New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament speaks of uh, eschatological prophecies, and the New Testament fulfills them. Um, for example, actually, eschatology begins in the garden. Uh, Adam was a priest king, and he was to faithfully obey God and conquer the satanic uh, opponent. Um, if he had done that, uh, he would have been ushered into an escalated uh, period for eternity of security, full rest spiritually and physically, and um, he would not have experienced any bodily corruption, nor would uh, the earth have experienced such corruption. Of course, he did not faithfully obey God. He himself, instead of conquering the serpent, was conquered by the serpent. But what we're saying here then is, and we can state it this way, is that eschatology precedes soteriology. That is, the doctrine of the end actually precedes this notion of the need for salvation. Because if Adam had been faithful, he would have been ushered into an eternal eschatological state. But because he wasn't, then there is now the need for salvation. And of course, we do get Genesis 3.15 that looks forward to a time when one would do what Adam should have done to defeat the serpent. Um, so the notion of the latter days in the Old Testament and, and, the, and the New Testament is crucial. If you just get a concordance, and uh, this was one thing that uh, completely altered my mind. I got a concordance, and I looked up the latter days in the old and the new. And I looked up synonyms like last hour, consummation of the ages, so on and so on. 
And it completely altered my thinking. Because I had always looked at eschatology as a futurology, something that was to take place in the yet future. And in fact, when you look at the Old Testament, I've given a handout. Unfortunately, I thought 100 would be enough, but apparently it's not. Um, but I've just given some highlights, not all the passages that deal with the latter days in the Old Testament, but all of them without exception are about the future. And that fit right in with my own view of eschatology very comfortably. It's all about the future. And so in Genesis 49, 1, it says, J Jacob summoned his sons, said, assemble yourselves and may tell you what shall befall you in the days to come. And we have uh, these passages just listed. I don't have them quoted for you on the handout. But uh, that latter-day prophecy that he speaks of has its zenith point in Genesis 49, 9 through 10, where uh, a, a messianic leader from the tribe of Judah is said to be a lion, and he will come, and uh, the obedience of the peoples will be to him. Um, and Numbers 24, likewise, is a messianic prophecy that uses this phrase, latter days. But again, it's about the future. Now behold, I'm going to my people, come and I'll advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. Now your handout says days to come. It's not a good translation by the New American Standard, but uh, it's actually in the latter days. And then Numbers 24, 17 to 19, right after that, speaks of a messianic figure who will come and defeat the Gentile enemy. Hosea 3, 4, again about the future. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and his goodness in the last days. So there you get the restoration of Israel, a messianic king who's said to be Davidic. Um, Isaiah 2, 2 uh, describes a huge temple that's going to occur in the latter days. It'll come about in the last days. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It'll be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. So you get this, this mountain temple that's growing and growing and growing. And so um, what we find then, uh, again, this is future. And there are a number of other passages. I'm only looking at the highlights here. Daniel 2.28, there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. Well, that, that, that vision about the latter days climaxes in the defeat of uh, all Gentile opponents of God's people and an eternal kingdom is established. And then Daniel 8, 17 to 19 refers to the end. And there it's talking about a tribulation in which there'll be persecution of God's people. Now, there'll be deception and false teaching. And Daniel 10, 4, listen to the wording. I've come to give you an understanding, Daniel, of what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision pertains to the days yet future. It is future. It's all future. That was fitting comfortably in my paradigm. And uh, a number of other passages here. One more in Daniel eleven forty, 40. And some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end time. So there'll, there'll be this persecution in the end time. Again, all of this is still future. Now, if we were to look at all the passages, and we've only looked at a few highlights, but if we were to look at all the passages with eschatological language and that were conceptually about the latter days, then you, you would find about roughly 10 things that the latter days are about. A coming tribulation, a false teaching, persecution and deception, after which... Um, Israel would be restored, they would be delivered, uh, their enemies judged, there would be a messianic leader. Actually, Hosea 3 calls him a Davidic king, and he would establish a king, a kingdom. Um, there'll be a huge temple, and there'll be the pouring out of the Spirit, according to Joel 2, 28 and following. There'll be a new covenant, a new creation, and resurrection of the righteous. And so it's these ideas that form the core of the end time expect expectation that is about the future. Now, let's come back to my paradigm change. I come to the New Testament, still with my concordance. And I'm looking, I read Acts 2.17. And it'll be in the last days, God says, I'll pour forth of my spirit upon all mankind. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And I, that, that just didn't fit. Because he's saying, 
the pouring out of the Spirit of Pentecost was the beginning of the last days. Well, I kept going. I thought, well, you know, that's just probably an anomaly. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, these things happen uh, to the Israelites in the wilderness as an example. They were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. I thought, well, there it is again. And then Hebrews 1, 1 to 2, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son whom he appointed heir of all things. Now there, that is a reference back to Psalm 2, which speaks of the son who will inherit the earth. That's a messianic king again, who will inherit the earth and dominate the nations. Uh, Hebrews 9, 26, which says that uh, at the consummation of the ages, Christ put away sin by sacrificing himself. And so you get again, at the ends of the ages, is this deliverance actually through death. Of course, among other passages, Isaiah 53 is one of those prophecies. First Peter 1.20, Christ is foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. And the preceding verse talks again about his sacrificial death, the following verse about his resurrection. And of course, resurrection is one of the great prophecies uh, about the future in the Old Testament. First John 2, 18, children, it's the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen. From this we know it is the last hour. So this last hour is the time he's saying that Antichrist has actually begun to come. Not just many Antichrists. He goes on to say the Antichrist in the following verses. This is really amazing because what he's saying is when you have Antichrist, you got the final great tribulation. That blew my mind. How could the great tribulation have begun in the first century? John says it did. Now, it's going to get worse and more universal, but it did begin. 2 Corinthians 5.17 it doesn't use latter days, but it does use new creation, where it says, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation, old things have passed away, behold, new things have come. And yet, as I read in my concordance, I did see, yeah, there's still some future references about the latter days in the New Testament. So what we find in the New Testament is a classic. Many of you have heard it already and not yet. In fact, much of what I'm saying in this lecture is really biblical theology 101. Um, so Matthew 13, 40 and following, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels. They'll gather, uh, they, they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks. And those who commit lawlessness will cast them into the furnace of fire. In that place they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels shall come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous. So here's a clear reference to the future. So we clearly have what we call, and already latter days have begun, but they're not completed. John 6, 40, Christ keeps saying there in the following verses, I will raise him up on the last day. He does that in chapter 11 and verse 24 of John. And then in verse 25, he says, those who believe in me will live even though they die. So, uh, and, and he goes on and says, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection is inaugurated. The great resurrection prophesied in Daniel 12, 1 and 2, where it says that many will sleep in the dust of the earth and uh, some will awake uh, to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So, um, so we get uh, a number of other passages about the future as well. So the notions, as you look at the Old Testament of a king and a kingdom ruling over the nations. Um, as you look at this throughout the Old Testament, intriguingly, uh, we don't have time to develop it, but it is developed in light of Genesis 1:28. Remember where God's blessed uh, Adam, and uh, he, he said, "Multiply and, and uh, uh, bear fruit, increase, fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over all the creatures." of the earth. That passage is used again and again and again and again with the patriarchs and later. In fact, I know of about three doctoral dissertations that have been done on how that passage is used in the Old Testament and, and there, there, there could be more. Um, but the point is there's the expectation of one to come to fulfill what the first Adam did not fulfill. 
He did not rule over the earth. He did not produce sons in the image of God, reflecting the image of God to fill the earth. So all these prophecies from the Old Testament, they take place. Every prophecy, and I tell my students sometimes, give me one prophecy that didn't begin to take place with Christ. And, um, and then I quote 2 Corinthians 1.20, for as many as may be the promises of God in the Old Testament, they are yes in him. So the apostles understood eschatology not merely then as futurology as the Old Testament, but as uh, uh, something that they understood was happening in their midst. It was a redemptive historical psychology. The latter days were beginning to be fulfilled. Every aspect of their salvation was to be conceived as, a, as eschatological in nature. To put another way, I would say, and I'm, I'm writing a part two to my New Testament biblical theology, that every, and it's a radical claim, but I would say every major doctrine in the New Testament has an eschatological tinge to it, an eschatological color to it. Just as when you put green sunglasses on, everything is green, Christ put eschatological sunglasses on the apostles, and everything they saw rightly was eschatological in nature. This means the doctrine of eschatology is not just one among many doctrines in a, in a New Testament biblical theology textbook. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be put at the end. It should be sprinkled throughout. And likewise, I would suggest even, and this may sound extreme, but uh, uh, systematic theologies should uh, pay more attention to inaugurated eschatology and their explanation uh, of New Testament doctrine. So understanding uh, most of the traditional doctrines, in my opinion, is not so much changed about what I'm saying now. In other words, uh, if people don't understand eschatology in your church, does that mean, oh, they just can't understand Christology or they can't understand uh, uh, pneumatology or whatever? No, but understanding esch eschatology, putting those lenses on, helps us to see more richly what the New Testament is saying. Um, and actually, what, what, what I'm arguing uh, in, in this short paper today is uh, uh, really expanded on in my New Testament biblical theology. And in a course, I have on New Testament Biblical Theology uh, on the online course site of a Gospel Coalition. But in light of what I've said, I would put it this way, that the storyline of the New Testament is that Christ's life, especially death and resurrection, and sending of the Spirit launched the new creational reign, and that propelled worldwide mission resulting in blessing and judgment, all for God's glory. But the major stepping stones in that storyline, I'm not saying it's one center, by the way, but in the storyline, the major stepping stones are Christ's death, resurrection, sending of the Spirit, launch this new creational reign. And um, I would contend that basically, as you look at all the different doctrines, major doctrines of the New Testament, that they become facets of a diamond, Picture a diamond with facets. So he puts sanctification on one facet, pneumatology on the other, image of God on another, ecclesiology on another. And what is the diamond? The diamond is the resurrected Christ uh, who is the beginning of the new creation. So that every doctrine is a facet of who Christ is. So when we come into union with Christ, these things about him are attributed to us. So he's sanctified, wasn't he? When he rose from the dead, sanctified, set apart from the earth. When we come into union with him, we're sanctified and set apart from the old world and from sin. When we come into union with him, we begin to participate in him being in the image of God. And then, of course, that's consummated at the end. All these things are consummated at the end. So that really, when you think about it, some would say, well, you know, Beal, uh, new creation, that phrase is not used very much. Uh, Galatians 6.15, 2 Corinthians 5.17, essentially Colossians 1.18, Revelation 3.14. That's really about it. But once you understand that resurrection is new creation, how are you and I going to become a part of the final new creation? Through resurrection. So that now our spiritual resurrection is the beginning of the fulfillment of those new creational 
resurrection prophecy. So even though you don't find the phrase new creation much, resurrection's all over the place in Paul. It's the grand goal in um, the Gospels and, of course, found often elsewhere. So uh, 2 Corinthians, again, 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And verses 15 to 16 relate that to the resurrection. It says, and the love of Christ controls us, evaluating this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died, in order that the ones living should live not for themselves, but for the one having died and been raised on their behalf. So they're identified with his resurrection there as a new creation, as 517 says. So when you think about it, and, and I, I would say at this point that uh, not taking seriously as a preaching pastor, not taking, taking seriously the resurrection language and reality applied to the Christian's present experience to designate real resurrection existence, to, to downplay that just because it's only a beginning spiritual thing as resurrection, unintentionally eviscerates the ethical power of church teaching and preaching since Christians need to know the resurrection power that they have. So when Daniel prophesied that those who sleep in the dust of the earth will arise and some to everlasting life, he wasn't thinking just of a physical resurrection. He was thinking of a resurrection of the whole being, spiritual as well. What he didn't see so clearly is that for us there would be a spirit, spiritual fulfillment of the resurrection prophecy first and then physical, just as I'm sure that Daniel would not have seen clearly that Christ would rise first physically and then his people later at the end of the age. So some think that, you know, when Paul speaks of resurrection, that we've been raised with Christ, well, that's metaphorical, it's figurative, we haven't really been. I would contend Paul means we really are resurrected beings in fulfillment of the resurrection prophecy, and if we really are, I'm not going to say it's a literal resurrection. I'm going to say it's a real resurrection. If we really are, that's going to affect the way we live. Now, of course, there are ups and downs in the Christian life. Christians can be confident that they will progressively conquer the remaining sin in their lives because you can't reverse the resurrection reality that they become a part of. You can't reverse that. It will eventually be consummated in full resurrection where body and spirit meet together. It's like an incomplete puzzle. All of us have done jigsaw puzzles, I'm sure, and uh, you can piece part of it together, but not everything. Our regenerate core has begun, uh, and some of the other pieces are falling into place, but we'll never put all, all of it together until God puts it together at the final resurrection. So this is why I think that Paul again and again and other New Testament writers will talk about our resurrection identity in the midst of commands. Now, some think that the commands mean we have the ability to obey them. Now, if you really look in the midst of those commands is our resurrection identity with Christ. Why? Because Paul knows the only way we can obey those commands is if we have the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.13 says, it's, a God, it's God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure through the resurrection power of Christ. It's especially important that pastors make clear to their congregations the eschatological resurrection power that they possess, that their congregation possesses as true believers, because awareness of this power enables believers to realize they have the ability to carry out God's commands. As 1 John 5, 3 says, if that's the case, if we're identified with the resurrected Christ, God's commands are not burdensome. They are if we don't have that power. Now, making people aware of this, some would say, Beal, I'm supposed to talk about eschatology in my sermons? I mean, I, that sounds a little abstract. As you preach expositorily over years be sensitive to the resurrection language that's there you don't even have to use the word eschatology just say this is the end time resurrection existence and our identity with the resurrected christ 
And as you begin to speak of that again and again, as it appears in the text, slowly perhaps, but surely this will sink into our people so they know the power that we have in order to please God and to obey His commands. So uh, some Christians say, well, if that's the case, if God's going to do it all, let's sit back and do nothing. Well, I would uh, say this to that, um, and it's an illustration. Uh, when I lived in Wheaton, Illinois, I had a neighbor. And when it started snowing, uh, he'd get out with his snowblower after just one inch of snow. He had all the desire and motivation in the world to do that. He had this big, beautiful new snowblower. Maybe his wife gave it to him. I don't know. But he had all the motivation in the world. After six inches had fallen, my wife would say uh, with an implicit command, Greg, when are you going to get out and shovel the snow? I had no motivation at all. Why? I had an old rusty shovel and a gravel driveway that made it more complicated. And so I had no desire. What's the difference between me and my neighbor? He had the power to do it. And so he's motivated. And not only that, if his wife gave him that, then he does it out of gratitude, a desire to please God out of gratitude. So the authentic Christian who is a true new creation is one who has the resurrection power of Christ. In the light of such texts we've seen uh, this afternoon, uh, we can understand St. Augustine's statement, quote, grant what you command and command what you will. It's only when we see that God does it all that we give him all the glory. I feel like I should give an altar call after that. Like, whew. It's hard to follow that, you know what I'm saying? Um, at the end of this lesson, uh, we're going to have a little surprise for some of you in here, so be sure to stick around. Uh, as, uh, oh, before we get started, I'm Ben Glad. I'm Associate Professor of New Testament at Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. As Professor Beale has demonstrated the end of the ages has indeed broken into history. Christ is the perfect Adam in true Israel who has come to achieve what all those before him have failed to achieve. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn to Mark 5. Everybody in here, turn to Mark 5, click to Mark 5, whatever you got to do. Mark 5, 1 through 20. The goal, just very briefly, is to focus on Jesus' actions in exercising the demons from the Gerizim demoniac in Mark 5, 1 through 20, and how Mark's depiction of this event serves as a paradigm for understanding the Old Testament and for sound preaching and teaching in our contemporary context. According to Mark 5, this demoniac embodies the nations who are bound by demonic forces and cannot save themselves. The true tyrant in the first century is Satan and his demons. Not the Canaanites, not the Assyrians, not the Babylonians, nor the Romans. The first four chapters of Mark's gospel, they highlight the liberation of the Jew Jewish people from Satan's grip, but its focus is in Galilee. Here his grip is in Decapolis. So what we have here in chapter five is Jesus is moving eastward. He's liberated the Jewish people in Galilee, and he's now gonna liberate the people on the eastern side of the lake, the nations. So let's read very quickly, Mark 5, 1 through 20. Jesus and the disciples went across the lake to the region of the Gerizines. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? 
In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has, on mercy, and how he has had mercy on you. So this man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. There's a strong connection between what Jesus does here and what he has done previously in the stilling of the storm in the previous section in 4, 35 through 41. In both scenarios, in this scenario and in the previous scenario with the stealing of the storm, the way that I read the stealing of the storm is that Jesus is exercising demons from the sea. It's fascinating. If you do a word study of land and sea, what do you get? It's the totality of creation. So Jesus is systematically reclaiming the land, reclaiming not just location, but he's also reclaiming people. The spirits not only infest the land, they defile the land, but they have infested the Jewish people and the Gentiles. And so here he's moving eastward. He's essentially taking over this entire territory. In fact, when he commands uh, the, the storm in uh, uh, verse 39, 439, he says, be quiet. he says, quiet, be still. This is precisely what he says in the exorcism in Capernaum in 125 when he tells the demon to what? Be quiet. Further, and in this vein, the exorcism, this is critical, the exorcism in the synagogue, the first one in the synagogue in Capernaum in 121 through 28 is very similar to the exorcism we get here in chapter 5. The first exorcism takes place in the Jewish house of worship, the synagogue, and there an unclean spirit has infested that place. In this scenario, we have 6,000 demons. They are now dwelling in a land of pagan idolatry, uncleanness, tombs among the nations. But the goal of both, this is important, the goal of both, both exorcisms, is that there's a purpose for the cleansing. Jesus simply doesn't cleanse people and then moves on. He cleanses people. He cleanses the area for the ultimate purpose of God dwelling with them. Jesus must rid the environment and people of all uncleanness. This is why in 5.2, notice it says, when Jesus got out of a boat, a man with an impure or unclean spirit came from the tombs to meet him. In verses 3 through 5, this is very interesting in the narrative. This is the longest description we have of an individual in all of Mark's gospel. Isn't that fascinating? He devotes three entire verses to describing how bad this man is off. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart, and he broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. We learn two things here. This demoniac is unable to be subdued. No one can bind him. Number two, this demoniac dwells in a place that reeks of defilement. Tombs, pigs, Gentiles, it's all here. Notice this, though. 
So this is a very powerful demon. He is named Legion, 6,000 soldiers. What does he do in verse 6? When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and what? Fell on his knees. He recognizes that he is inferior. See that? He, re- he bows in submission to Jesus. Think about that. Nobody could do what Jesus is about to do. And Jesus doesn't have to do anything. Immediately the demon realizes he is outranked. Verse 7. What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Filled with irony. In verse 41 of chapter 4, immediately following the stilling of the storm, the disciples cry out, They were terrified and asked, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. It ends on a question. Do you notice that? Ends on a question. What do we get later on in chapter 5? The demon answers the question that the disciples pose. The demon has more insight into Jesus' identity than the 12. Those closest to him don't recognize it. Yet those who are hostile to him immediately acknowledge it. Their issue is not Christology. They have good doctrine. James says that even the demons believe and they tremble. This title, the Son of the Most High God, it's used a few times in the Old Testament, Genesis 14, Psalm 78. It's reserved exclusively for God. There is no doubt that Legion recognizes that Jesus is the God-man. He recognizes that immediately. What this means is that Jesus is not simply the Messiah. He is the sovereign ruler of the cosmos. As the ruler of the universe, Jesus, what does he do? He's now going to turn the, the tables because in exorcisms, it's a, it's, you invoke a person's name to attempt to wrest control of them. So Legion comes up and he, by summoning Jesus' name, Son of the Most High, it is an attempt to seize some control of Jesus. But what does Jesus do? He flips it around. What we have here then is all the trappings of a battle. I want you to envision this. This is a battle. Notice how the disciples are off the scene. They're with Jesus. It says that at the end, at the beginning. But the disciples, they're not named at all. It's just Jesus and legion. Even that term legion is a military term. This is an end time. Remember what Dr. Beale said about eschatology? That's this right now. We're seeing Jesus do what he's supposed to do. This is an end time war between the God-man, Yahweh, and the perfect Adam in one person. Isn't that fascinating? Two natures, Yahweh and the perfect Adam and true Israel are now united in one man against the forces of evil. Jesus has ushered in the latter days, the very end of history, and here he is bringing a battle. He is waging this war. Now Mark records that some 2,000 pigs rushed into the Sea of Galilee where they drowned. We see that in 513. Keep in mind that we're also on the heels of the stealing of the storm. Now that's important because in the stealing of the storm, Jesus is reclaiming the sea. Symbolically, he's simply because he had been casting out demons throughout Galilee, reclaiming the land. Here he moves into the sea in the stilling of the storm, and he's basically saying, It is mine. This is my territory. So the, the demons, they wish to get into the pigs, to possess these pigs, to go into the sea. But it's really interesting is that Jesus has already judged the sea, he's already claimed it and named it, as it were. So when the demon-possessed pigs crash into the lake here in 513, Mark concludes that these demons have joined their compatriots in judgment. They have admitted defeat, in other words. In fact, this is fascinating. In 510, the major concern of Legion is what? Don't send us into another area. Notice that? Have you ever wondered why? It's because this is their home. We've infested the Decapolis. 
We've enslaved these nations. They're ours. Don't send us into another place because you've reclaimed that property. But Jesus is going, no. You, I'm basically uh, reclaiming the cosmos, Galilee, the sea, and now the Decapolis. The devil and his minions have the Decapolis in a vice grip. This is their territory. But Jesus, now remember Jesus' name? Do you know what name that is? It's Joshua, right? Joshua is known for the conquest. Jesus, or Joshua, is reclaiming the territory and filling it with God-fearing image bearers. Adam, he should have cast out the serpent out of the garden. Israel should have exterminated the idolatrous Canaanites. Here it is. For the first time in the history of humanity, the forces of evil are decisively subdued. Jesus did this Jesus precisely did that in the wilderness temptation, chapter 1 of Mark. And here he's continuing that process. He's now working it out here in chapter 5. If we think big picture here, what Jesus is doing in chapter 5 as well, I think a careful reader would notice how striking this event is how strikingly similar this event is with the drowning of Pharaoh's army. Have you thought about that? In Exodus 14 and 15, here you have the Egyptian army mounted against the Israelites. But do you notice Yahweh is this divine warrior? Here, legion is mounting an attack upon the people of God, namely Christ. So you have both situations. You have military in play. And how are the Egyptians defeated? How are they defeated? By drowning in the sea. How is this enemy defeated? By drowning in the sea. In Exodus 15, it's Yahweh, the warrior, who judges Pharaoh's army. Who is it here? Jesus, the Lord, Yahweh in the flesh. Judgment of the Egyptians, if you keep reading in chapter 14, judgment of the Egyptians results in what? God receiving the glory, great things he has done. What do we get here in 520? Judgment of legion results in Jesus receiving the glory as well. Do you see that? So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. Do you see? He's proclaiming Jesus. And then in Exodus 15, 14, the nations admit to God's unrivaled power. And here in 520, again, if, I, if I'm reading this rightly, the people of the Decapolis admit to Jesus' unmatched power. So what are some reflections? Here are three of them very briefly. Number one, when we do this sort of thing, I think this is a great case study of biblical theology, old and the new, already not yet. Number one, use your cross-references if you don't have a Bible. Sell your kidney and get one. I don't know what to tell you. You can get a lot of good Bibles for that. Please use the terrific reference by uh, Professor Beale and Carson, the commentary on the New Testament use of the old. That will help you with uh, there as well. Also, what I'm also advocating is this idea of learning the patterns of the Old Testament. And this is what this is work. You have to learn, you have to read the scriptures over and over, notice patterns, right? Once you understand the patterns, then you can really see what Jesus is doing. For example, the stilling of the storm in Mark 4 recalls the Israelites emerging through the waters of chaos. The exorcism here at the Gizim, in the Gerizim demoniac alludes to Israel's conquest. The feeding of the 5,000 in Mark 6 looks back to Yahweh feeding his people in the wilderness. Do you see that? Like these are patterns in Jesus' career, the more we understand the Old Testament, the more we understand the patterns, the greater the person of Christ is. Let me pray. Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're thankful for these patterns. We're thankful that you defeated Satan decisively. And we look forward to the day when you will do so completely. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.